I'm very thankful to see uh, everybody that's here tonight. I understand it's uh, quite a nasty evening, uh, so certainly appreciate uh, seeing y'all. Also, it's just a wonderful place to be. I always enjoy Wednesday nights. <clears throat> if you got your Bibles, we invite you to turn to the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. As you make your way over to 1 John, we'll go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, we come tonight. We're so thankful for the many blessings that you've given us. We're so thankful for the wonderful word uh, that you have blessed us to have, that you have written to us. And, and uh, Lord, we're so thankful for the truth that's contained in it. And I ask that, as you, that you would help us as uh, we'd look to it tonight, uh, that you'd settle our minds, that we, we may be very attentive to your word, that we would be very attentive to uh, the, the message that the Holy Spirit would have to bring out. And I ask that the Holy Spirit would draw out that message, uh, that it would not be anything of my own accord or my own desire that I would not stand to prove any sort of point whatsoever, but to deliver the message that you would have, that I would be a humble vessel, obedient to your will. And God, I'm so thankful that I can find sufficiency in you because there is none to be found in me. Uh, Lord, I very often overcomplicate things. I very often uh, find, find plenty of mistakes in myself, and I'm so thankful I have a solid foundation to look to and to rely on, that all glory may go to you, that, that your church may be lifted up, and that I would receive no glory from it. Uh, Lord, we ask that if there would be one here that's lost tonight, that they would see a need to trust you. And that they could see that, that uh, whatever it may be that, that they're counting on, whether it be uh, just getting around to it eventually, whether it be just hoping for the best, whether it be a, a, a false idea of what salvation even is, uh, that whatever it may be that would hinder them from coming to saving knowledge and faith in you, Lord, help them uh, to, to see through the facade. Help them to see uh, how desperate and, and how in need they are of someone to save them and help them to understand how simply you've made that salvation to be, that you've already purchased everything, you've done all the work, and you provide it freely to them. Lord, please help them to understand the wonderful gospel that, that you have given to the world. And please help those of us who are saved that we'd be busy to bring that message to the world, that we would rejoice in so great a salvation that you've given to us and have a desire to share it with others. And please help us also as we study through 1 John that we would draw encouragement, uh, that we see that, that you have given it to the church to encourage her, uh, that, that we may have an assurance of our salvation, that we may understand uh, that we are not just on some faraway speck, uh, blinded and, and, and lost and, uh, and hoping for the best, but that you have given us a salvation that is so firm, so steady. Lord, uh, we certainly would live lives that aren't so firm and aren't so steady. We live lives that are very hectic, uh, lives of sorrow and, and tribulation. We have such a great assurance and salvation. We're so thankful for that. And please help us to be strengthened in it. It's in your wonderful and holy name we pray if you're so worthy. Amen. First John chapter 2, we'll read verse 19. It says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For had they been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. And we'll stop reading here. Uh, you'll, you'll notice that in verse 19, we'll start with the word they. Uh, the, the word they refers back to verse 18 in which he describes those antichrists. And we spent some time uh, two weeks ago looking at who those antichrists are, how that they are those that deny Christ, that they have denied the, the flesh, the, the, the fact that Christ had come, that God had come and, and then dwelt himself as a man, that he came and was, was human as we are. And that's very important that God did such because we needed a high priest that could sympathize with us. We needed a substitute. We needed a sacrifice that was on the same level of us, fleshly speaking, that was subject to the same things that we are subject to. And so, so God would become man and subject himself, that he would endure the temptation of sin, or that he would live with the weakness of the flesh, but that he would live perfectly, that he would be a perfect sacrifice. Those who were these antichrists were those that would deny God as man, but they were also those that would deny God as God, that they would say that Christ was just some man, he, was no, he had no deity to him at all. And, and we've spent time at, through our study of First John uh, looking to that very early heresy I've made mention of called de uh, deism. Um, that might not even be the right word. I hope that I'm using the right word. I think that's what, it, regardless, it was those folks, um, how that, that they would, they would look at Christ as though that, 
he was either all God and that God couldn't become man because man is just terrible. And so there's no chance that God could ever become man. Or, or they would look at it in, in the other sense that they had. They would reject one aspect of who Christ was. And they did this to really just write off entirely a call to a sanctified life. But they would say that, that the flesh is just inherently sinful. And because the flesh is sinful, then we might as well just sin. And the Spirit, the, the Lord will redeem the Spirit. But that, that doesn't mean we have to change anything at all. And they would go on living just wicked, terrible lives, claiming to have a knowledge of the truth. They were also very wrapped up in, in what they had. They would have their own gospels. They would have their own teachers. And that they would say, well, this knowledge was just given to us miraculously. And Scripture was given miraculously. Scripture was given by inspiration of God. It is God-breathed, but it was not God-breathed through them. All the things that they had taught, all the things that they had written was totally contrary to the rest of Scripture. It didn't match up. God's Word is God-breathed, but it all flows together from beginning to end. There, there would be no contradictions. And so what they, what they were hanging their hope on was just utter nonsense, and there would be a division of the church, and there would be those that went away. And that's when we come to verse 19. Th these are the people that he's addressing, those antichrists, those people who are totally against who Christ is who have left the church and the leaving of the church, it really caused some concern for them. That's why, as we've been studying, and as we will continue to study, uh, I, I think I even made mention of this at the beginning of our study in 1 John, how that, that the book is written as though it is just the, the, uh, the, the basics of the faith, so to speak. It brings us back to the roots of what a genuine faith is. And he does this, to, he scales it way back, and he, a very simple, very direct uh, uh, messaging. He would go and help them to settle their faith, to help them to have an assurance that God provides to them. And that this splitting, this, this going away of these people, that doesn't mean anything to them. Uh, for, for them, that ought, not to, uh, that ought not to rock them at all. It ought not to, to, to discourage or dissuade them from a genuine faith in Christ. And he says in verse 19, it, I, I made mention in verse 18, how the, the, the uh, verse had a structure in, in which uh, it, it was A, B, and then kind of the opposite of B, and then the opposite of A. It, it made this big circle. In verse 18, he said, It is the last time you've heard the Antichrist shall come, even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know it's the last time. We see that circular reasoning. Verse 19 at least the first half of it does the very same thing, is that they went out from us. They did not really belong to us. If they did belong to us, they would have not gone out from us. It's a circular reasoning, but it's a reasoning that makes sense. And so he would let them know that this is not just some uh, horrible thing. This doesn't mean that your faith was in vain. It doesn't mean that the God that you profess to believe in isn't right. They were wrong. They left. They decided to depart. And because they departed, we can see they didn't lose salvation. They, they, they didn't have something and then go lose it. They never had it to begin with. And so he, he, he lets them know this. And in letting them know this, we see something very important in what a genuine believer is. Because a genuine believer doesn't depart. A genuine believer perseveres. This is something we see continually through the new testament and if we are not careful and if we miss out on the context we can actually get really confused by what these verses mean and we'll turn it and read a couple of them uh, go with me to hebrews chapter 3 hebrews chapter 3 we'll begin reading in verse 19. No, verse 12. Yeah, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12. It says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. For some, 
when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. For with whom was he grieved forty years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. And if we take this verse uh, and we're very careless with it, we can actually come up with a works-based salvation. We can come up with a salvation in which we say, well, yes, it needs faith, but it also needs uh, the believer to, to never fail. That, that, that we, we might find a work-based salvation. We may even find a salvation that can be lost, but that's not what these scriptures teach. In verse 12, he says, take key. We ought to pay attention to it. He says, lest there be any of you uh, any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Take heed to make sure our hearts are correct, that our hearts are not evil, and that our hearts will not eventually depart. He says that in verse 13, But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end there will be those who will take such a scripture and say that well you see you can lose your salvation if you're not diligent enough your salvation will go away look he says he says that that's required that we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end to ever obtain salvation and while this is partially true we do need to continue to be faithful we must continue we must persevere the thing is is a genuine faith perseveres it has to it is not something that you do. For, for we have, in our, in our own nature, there is no hope of perseverance. In, in, in our flesh, there is nothing but weakness and sin. But as God saves a soul, I've said this countless times now, and I will continue to say it, God's salvation is far greater than just forgiving us of some sins. It indwells a, a new nature. It's a new creation with new desires. And he places in that believer a heart that wants to serve the Lord, a heart that continually perseveres. He uses the example of those in, uh, of Israel who in the day of provocation, the day in which they finally would come to the promised land and they would send those spies in and the spies would come back and they would reject God, that they would not believe, that God would tell them that he would be with them, that, that he would give them, as it says in the scriptures, wells digged and houses uh, furnished and vineyards planted, things that would take many, many years to, to do that those people in the land had already done those things, the Lord was just going to go give it to them. That as they would go into battle, the Lord would remind them continually, I will be with you. And he had already showed it to be so. He delivered them out of Egypt. But then they would get there, and they had some deceitful, wicked hearts. And their wicked hearts would not believe in God. And because they didn't believe in God, it revealed that their hearts were wicked all along. They never had faith all along. There were those that had faith. Moses had faith that God would bring them into the land. Caleb had faith. Joshua had faith. But there were those that had faith that they would take the land, but many of them did not. And many of them revealed the true, uh, a true unrepentant heart, a true unregenerate heart. That this, it, 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 we must be careful to make sure that our hearts are not such. Uh, but this is kind of what that means to, to continually persevere. If we go... Into chapter 10 of Hebrews, we see something very similar. In verse 26, Hebrews 10, in verse 26, it says, For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who had trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. As he would write this in Hebrews 10, he describes those in verse 26 who willfully sin. And this isn't just a, a, a slip up, as we would say. There's going to be a continual sin. We read in 1 John that, that anybody who says that they're without sin is a liar. And the truth is not in them. So obviously we find sin in a believer. What he is speaking of are those that continually go to sin. That they, that they have no sign whatsoever of this new birth. 
that it, it, and even in the way that it's written, it, it appears as though that they are counting on something else alongside Christ to save them. Another very early heresy would be that of the, the, uh, the Judaizers. And I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. Uh, but it would be those who would... Actually, the book of Galatians really deals with it. But there would be those that say, well, yes, we need faith, but now we need to bring the law in and we, we need to have both. And both of them will, will produce a salvation. But he says here that there is no more sacrifice for sins. The sacrifice is done. The work is paid for. A, a, a genuine faith places faith in Christ and in Christ alone. There were those that had placed some faith in Christ, but then they also mix their thoughts and their works into the mix and come up with, with something that, that was quite ugly and something that, quite frankly, would lead them straight to hell. He, he would write and, and say of, of how much sore punishment. He spoke to, to the law of Moses, how that if somebody had committed a sin worthy of death, it would take two or three witnesses and they could be put to death. And he says, of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God. And kind of the blood wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and have done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Those that had taken that beautiful salvation that Christ has provided to the world and threw it on the ground and walked across it and said that, that they needed to supply something. It says that they have counted the blood wherewith they were sacrificed an unholy, uh, sanctified an unholy thing. We, we understand in the Scriptures that salvation is, is purchased by the blood of Christ. First Peter would write that, you are not, that we're not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold, uh, but with the precious blood of Christ. It, it is perfect. It is pure. It is sufficient to wash away sins, and nothing else is. But there are those that, that would uh, have their faith all wrong, that their heart, it would, they would eventually depart from the faith and start seeking to add works into the mix. And as they would, what they were really saying is that Christ is not sufficient enough to save me. His blood is not pure enough to wash away my sins. Therefore, I have to do something. And he says, of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who does that, who takes the Son of God and reduces him to nothing. And then he would go on to say, well, vengeance belongs to the Lord, and it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Perseverance of the believer Perseverance of the believer does not depart and start adding works into the mix. Perseverance of the believer does not part, depart from the faith altogether. Uh, perseverance of a believer doesn't abandon the truth for a lie. It, but perseverance is an undeniable part of a genuine believer's life. They cannot be separated. Consider that at salvation, again, despite what uh, others may teach, at the moment of salvation... That, a, that we are indwelt with the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit of God goes into you and you become one. And that Holy Spirit, it, it's substantial. It isn't something that, that, we, we, that, that we, we just talk about. It's not something that, that we uh, j just throw around in a couple of songs or, or say that we rely on here and there. It's God Almighty. And the God of the universe, the one who is a part of creation, the one who is from the beginning, who is eternal, who is omnipotent, omnipresent, and, 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 and omniscient, that's the other one, who has all the knowledge, all the power, and he is in all places. This mighty God dwells inside of you if you are saved. That's going to change something. It's going to do something, and it will not allow you to leave it will not allow you to abandon the faith perseverance is an undeniable part of a genuine believer's life and then you say but but what about and we have a bunch of examples but what about the disciples if you'd recall whenever christ was in the garden and they come to arrest him and you know peter would would uh, cut off the fellow's ear and christ would put it back on but but shortly thereafter the disciples left they all fled Every one of them, gone. Eventually, John would kind of come, come back around uh, during the crucifixion, but, but the rest of them, they were gone. What about them? They departed. We have an example. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 20. I think I referenced this scripture Sunday. We never did read it. We're going to take time to turn and read it. Jeremiah 20.
Jeremiah chapter 20. We'll look at verse 7. They say, O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me, and a derision daily. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. Now we'll continue to read the rest of the verse. The rest of the verse is very important. But you say, what about these examples? These people departed. These people, they, they showed weakness. They faltered. They failed. What about these people? Well, the genuine believer, do they stumble? Sure. Do they sin? Absolutely. Is there a remnant left of the flesh that is going to continually fail until that wonderful day in which we receive our glorified body comes? 100%. But the genuine believer returns. The disciples, they returned. Here, Jeremiah, after he said, I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name. He said, but his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. See, Jeremiah, he was confused. He was discouraged. Uh, he was more than just discouraged. I mean, he was he was beaten. He, he was treated very harshly. His life was in danger. And finally he said, I give up. These people, they don't want to hear about God. They don't care anything about God. I'm done. And he said, but his word was in my heart. It, 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 it burns in him. It says to the point that I was weary with forbearing. He, he, got, he, he got so tired of not speaking. The Lord would not allow him to quit and so he didn't. This wasn't something that Jeremiah could boast in. We'll spend some more time on that later. But it is a working of God himself. And that working of God is evident in a believer's life. We see a couple of examples uh, that, that, that are, are just so wonderful to me. Uh, one of my favorite examples would be the examples of Judas and Peter. That if you look, they virtually did the exact same thing. Uh, Judas would betray Christ. Peter would deny Christ. And, and, and Peter would deny Christ three times. And Judas, he would go off and eventually hang himself. Peter came back. The difference, one was a genuine believer. One persevered. One faltered. They failed horribly. They, they, they really denied their Savior. But they came back. That is the, a, a, an example of what a genuine believer is one who fails, but one who continues to persevere. Uh, turn with me to Acts 15. We see another example here. Acts 15. Verse 36 is where we will begin reading. Acts 15, and verse 36. It says, And some days after Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again, visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord, and see how they do. And Barnabas determined to take with them John, whose surname was Mark. But Paul thought it not good to take him with them, who departed from them from Pamphylia, and went not with them to the work. And the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed unto Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas, and departed, being recommended by the brethren of the grace of God. In this example, we have John Mark. And John Mark is, is very infamous uh, for, for doing exactly as, as we read here, uh, that they were supposed to go uh, and, and go into Pam, Pamphylia or Pamphylia, however you'd like to pronounce that. And they were supposed to go and do some ministry, and just before they would depart, John Mark fled. He left. That, that we, they had this big plan. Paul and Barnabas are getting ready to go. And John Mark gets scared and leaves. And so what happened evidently is John Mark had come back. And they were, fixing, they were getting ready to depart. And Paul would say, no, we're not bringing him with us. He's shown himself not to be faithful. And this would cause some disagreement. So Paul and Barnabas would split. Well, let's go to the book of 2 Timothy and continue reading there. Thankfully, the scriptures uh, don't leave us hanging on, on how that relationship panned out. Second Timothy, chapter four, I believe. Chapter two, sorry. 
2 Timothy. No, it's got to be chapter 4. Can't even get my notes right. It's chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 9. He said, Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and has departed unto Thessalonica, uh, Crescens to Galatia, Titus unto Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. He, as, as Paul writes to Timothy, he says, Come quickly. And he mentions this man, Demas. He's forsaken me, having loved this present world. And he makes mention that he had sent, some other, he had sent uh, Titus away, for instance. He had sent him to minister somewhere else. And, and he had sent, um, let's see, uh, uh, Crescens, he had sent him somewhere. And, and, and he just had Luke. But he says, bring Mark with you. That's the very same Mark mentioned of in Acts, by, by, by best I can tell. It would be the very same person. He had departed. He failed. He fled. And then Paul would say, bring him because he's profitable to me. There was a genuine believer in John Mark. And John Mark returned. John Mark was not content with leaving. He was not content with quitting. He got scared. But he, like Jeremiah, was weary with forbearing. But here in these very same scriptures, he says in verse 10, For Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and it is departed unto Thessalonica. What separated John Mark from Demas? The very, very same thing. John Mark fled at one point. Demas had fled. The difference is Demas didn't return. Demas had quit. Demas did not persevere. Perseverance is, is a must. It, it is a clear, evident sign of genuine faith. And he would say in 1 John that those that left left because they were never of us. They had left and they did not return. And they did not return because they never had faith to begin with. They didn't lose something. They had never actually had it. But he would go on to write in the same verse, in verse 19. They went out. He tells why God allowed this to happen. It says, but they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. That they might be made manifest. That, that in other words, that, that it might be very clear to us that they were not of us. You see, it did not take God off guard. It, it did not catch Him. It did not surprise Him. God, God wasn't doing His business in heaven and, and, and causing the sun to rise and doing all this stuff. And He looked down and said, Oh my goodness, those people left the church. I never saw that happening. I never, never could have ever seen this. But the Lord allowed it to happen, and He allowed it to happen for a purpose. He allowed it to happen that the church may see what it looks like for those that don't persevere. It wasn't that God kicked them out the church. God didn't stick His divine fingers inside of their heart and turn them against Him. That would be contrary to His will. It would be contrary to His character. But He knew that they never had faith to begin with. And he allowed them to, to enter in uh, in the assembly of God. He allowed them to fellowship with him and he allowed them to leave. That way those who had a genuine faith could look and see something different. That they could look and find confidence in their faith. But that confidence, it, it was not at all uh, something that they could boast in. He didn't, you know, it wasn't that they could look at those that had left and say, well, look how good of a Christian I am. Look at look how good that I have become. But rather that they could look and they could see there's something different about me. It's not something I did. There's something that is, I am not the same as them. But why is that? I understand by no means am I better than anybody else. By no means am I more moral than anybody else. But what, I, what they could see is, well, God has done a divine work in me. He's giving me a new nature that they don't have because they never had faith, and I do. Again, it was not something to go and to boast in. There's a, uh, in Luke chapter 18, there's a parable given of the Pharisee and the publican that had went to, to pray. And as we look at the Pharisee's prayer, it is so man-centered and 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 very familiar kind of scripture I know, but he was saying, thank God that I'm not like this publican. That, that I tithe of all that I have. I do this, I do that. I'm such a good person. 
See, he was trying to find, he found a whole lot of confidence in himself. He was very boastful and very prideful and very arrogant in himself. And that man did not go away justified. Turn with me to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll see somebody else with just as much, if not more, confidence that was perfectly justified. Confidence isn't sinful. Confidence is what every believer is blessed to have. God has gifted us an incredible confidence. But it is where we place that confidence that we must pay attention to. God had allowed those to depart from the faith. That way those with genuine faith could say, God has changed me. God has supplied this. 1 Corinthians 15, verse, um, we'll see. In verse 8, he is describing those that had seen the resurrected Christ. And he says, And last of all, he was seen of me also, as one born out of due time, for I am the least of the apostles, that I am not meet to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. And we say, well, that doesn't sound confident. That sounds like somebody that has no self-esteem whatsoever. He say that he is not even, he's not even deserving to be called an apostle because of the sins that he had committed. But verse 10, it says, But by the grace of God I am what I am. And His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. Which was with me, sorry. The grace of God that was with me. This, this man here, and more confidence here. We'll take these scriptures together. Back in, in 2 Timothy in that very same chapter that we were in, in chapter 4, Paul makes a statement that is, is so incredible to me. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, he would say, uh, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. This is a, a man, Paul, very, very confident, very humble, very confident, not arrogant, very confident, but also justified. You see that Pharisee, he was very confident, but he was confident in I. Thank God that I'm not like that person. I tithe. I give. I keep the law. I do these things. When Paul was confident, he said, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And he would go on to write, and he said, and the grace given to me was not in vain, because I labored more abundantly than they all. We said, well, that sort of sounds arrogant. But he wraps it all and says, yet not I. He said, yet not I. Um, but the grace that was with me, by the grace of God, I'm changed. By the grace of God, I no longer persecute the church. By the grace of God, I have finished the course. I have kept the faith because God has changed something in me. That is the, the assurance that a believer has as they look around and they have every opportunity to depart from the faith. That's why trials are so important, by the way. That's why we have written in the book of James, chapter 1, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Boy, we could, people laugh that verse up. People make fun of that idea. That, that whenever the worst things in life happen, when the person you care most dearly about dies, well, thank God they're dead. People make these jokes. Is that how I'm supposed to act? But what he is saying is to count it all joy when you fall into these temptations. Why? Because as it's described in 1 Peter, that the trial of your faith is more precious than gold. That the trial of your faith results in a glorifying of God and the trial of your faith reveals to you that that faith is genuine. Whenever things come up, whenever trials happen, you see, it, it is not that we, can, we can't find confidence in God because nothing bad ever happens to us. God said that He reigns on the just and the unjust. He blesses all. He, he causes hardship, hardships on all. Just because God's been good to me, that doesn't mean that I'm saved. But I can look at trials in my life. I can look whenever 
things quite literally fall apart and I can look and see that my faith had never wavered. And I can understand I'm not that good of a person so I couldn't have done that. I have no ability to be faithful. I'm just, as Paul said, not even meet to be called. I'm not even meet to be called a child of God. I'm not deserving to be called a servant of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. By the grace of God, I have an unmovable confidence. We ought not to fret because everything falls apart. We ought not to fret whenever we see others depart from the faith. But God allows us to happen that we may see our perseverance. And not a perseverance that we boast in. A perseverance that He has changed us to be able to have. This will be the message. Well, for a verse of invitation.